Alrighty. Uh, so I'm Danny, uh, author of Learn Robotics Programming in my recent book, uh, Robotics at Home and Bradford by Pico. Uh, I've been building robots for about 20 years, uh, channeling my inner eight-year-old, having lots of fun doing it. Uh, and tonight I'm going to give a tour of uh, robots I've been building, oh, try not to knock them off, uh, with Arduinos, ESPs uh, and Raspberry Pis. Um, many currently have a Raspberry Pi, uh, some have had them added. Uh, and we'll also make a bit of time at the end for Q&A. Um, so these robots, they're all kind of bodgy, and that's because I'm all about robots you can build in your home or in my home with whatever I've got here, whatever I can get my hands on. Uh, sometimes I use tools like a 3D printer, a laser cut things, but some of it I just do with hand tools. Most of it's hand tools. Um, I design with CAD, but then sometimes it's just pencil ruler on the back of an envelope. I tried to keep the electronics simple, so I'm using modules that are easy to get hold of. There's one or two boards that I've custom made. There's a lot more breadboarding. Uh, there's occasionally interesting things I managed to get from Kickstarter, Alibaba, Indiegogo, that kind of thing. None of my robots are finished products. None of them are molded. None of them are you know, that kind of pretty. They're all designed to be modified, hacked, experimented with. They've all got plenty of room for improvement. So I guess let's get into some robots. Um, so my first few robots I built were made out of Lego, and sadly I've got none of those still around. But uh, I think one of the first ones to get into is this big boy here. Um, this is Armbot. Uh, it was built around 2009, and it was built originally around was it an EPC with... Uh, a USB to ITC control. It's got this rather neat MD25 control. I mean, if I can get the camera in on, on that uh, motor controller down there. Um, it's just got nice speed control PIDs. It's got encoders actually on board, um, all read by that board. Um, cut it from some fine material, bolted that together. It's kind of evolved. The EPC was replaced first by an Arduino, which led to it kind of lifting up and popping a wheelie because there was nowhere on the front eventually became a Raspberry Pi, and I think there's a Pi 3 in there now. Um, and then eventually I added this arm that I got from some Kickstarter, um, I think it was a U-arm, which I kind of strapped on at PyCon UK. Now, the mistake I made with this, uh, and I got plenty of robots, was I cannibalized it. Um, when you get kind of get into many projects, you find yourself cannibalizing older projects to get parts, especially when Raspberry Pis are hard to get hold of. And I definitely regret it. And I'd say if you're kind of doing new projects, if you can buy the new stuff, because you always regret when you come back to a project and you've taken all the bits off. Um, this one has currently got no batteries. Uh, it's got half of its power stuff missing, half of its wiring missing. Um, so it's been neglected, which is a shame because I think it promises to be quite an awesome platform. Uh, just got to get the camera to stand up again. Um, I also plan to kind of do some local speech stuff with it. So the next robot I did, well, not so heavy hatch robots and things, was uh, this thing here, which is uh, very clearly Arduino Uno based. Uh, and this was around about 2011. And I kind of called it the uh, Orion Explorer One kit. And what I was trying to do at the time was make a low cost kit for uh, hobbyists and educators. I've been to, again, PyCon, uh, PyCon UK, there'd be an education track. And uh, I suppose my slightly obsessed mind said, hey, we could do robots. Um, and the problem is it all seemed too expensive. So I kind of got this kit to a, I think it was under 100 quid for the basic kit. Um, it was all based on parts that imported from China. And there's an LT98 controller, an Arduino, and occasionally various different kinds of sensors. Um, a couple of problems with it, which was uh, the four wheel setup actually made it tricky to turn on carpet. But the bigger problem, was I kept getting variations in parts I was receiving, which meant if I was kitting them out and giving them to people, the instructions weren't going to always work because I was getting these variations. Um, I, it was also my first attempt at anything like that, so I was kind of kitting and retailing and packaging and passing everything myself, and I pretty much made zero profit, ran out of steam, and went, this is not fun. Um, the robot worked. I had, did have fun doing the sensors and applications on it, but it was pretty much doomed as any kind of business venture. Um, there is a version somewhere of this with a Raspberry Pi attached as well, but I don't have that assembled. Um, next robot along, and this one's kind of coming to make affairs, uh, is this little kind of tanked track robot. Um, 
It's got a Raspberry Pi Zero. In fact, there's a Zero W now, so I think it's been update, updated. And it's rather cool, PyCon Zero. Uh, got this chassis somewhere online. Just this was just, I don't know, random eBay. It was kind of a bit of a toy hat, but I think it's designed to be messed with. Um, and there's an old gearbox with a servo stuffed into it to make up the turret. Um, it's got some issues with power, mostly in terms of weight and size, or I could probably fix that with a LiPo, um, LiPo plus a UBEX solution. Uh, I do want to get this little guy going. Um, there's these bits here that look like they light up. They don't, but I'd love to get some RGB uh, LED strips in those. Uh, next up. So this is Unitron. Um, and I think these were a kit, uh, might have been Fortronics. Um, so this was what for me to start mucking around with the Arduino Nano and this driver, which is basically complete overkill for a robot that's got two motors. Um, now, I also built this with my son, who basically wanted to program it to tip over by making it turn full lock and drive as fast as it could till it fell over. Um, it's it's kind of fun. Um, I also kind of like you know using these uh, HCSRI fours because a they're handy for wall avoiding, but also they're handy for showing you where the front of a robot is. Um, which became quite important with this next robot. Uh, this is Spiderbot. I'll put it under the camera there. Uh, it's a hexapod, um, and this was kind of a kit I got that was laser cut. Um, and it was while ESP 8266s were really popular. So it's uh, ESP 8266 based, one of these uh, Node MCU boards. Um, and I started trying in Lua code, but actually I eventually kind of, well, MicroPython hit the scene and that was a far better deal for what I was trying to do with this. Um, there's also the I2C, uh, is it the PCA9865 in there, controlling all the servos. There's 18 servos. I had to find two more. So two more of the pins on the uh, ESP are in use. Um, I found that experimenting with gates and lots of different ways I tried to do it was a great way of making the SP run out of memory. Uh, so it ran out of memory a lot. Um, but also it was one of the first where I had Wi-Fi so I could kind of start and stop things remotely, which was quite handy, defeated by the fact that actually this thing I was uh, initially powering it just completely tethered. It could also benefit from some LiPos. Um, but the power issue I had with this was current. So I am kind of fond of just mucking around with these little uh, DuPont leads, which are fine for some things, but with 18 servos, the return path current, current on the ground was so much it got kind of melty. Uh, so I had to kind of double up and try thicker cabling. Um, the other problem with it is because, again, it was a, a cheap kit, these legs do snap. Uh, I've had problems there. You know, I've had to go and replace a few of them. Uh, and these servos are also the cheap ones where the gears go. So it could probably do with some upgrades and perhaps I could do with making a more solid one, perhaps use a 3D printer for it. Uh, next up is this guy. And you can probably already see some of the issues with it. Um, so this one's known as Skittlebot uh, and it's, it comes, comes with uh, an accessory. Um, and it was around this time that I was experimenting more with Raspberry Pi and the fact that I had a camera. And to be honest, the camera connection got me excited because I was like, right, I can start making robots that do some more interesting things. Uh, and there was a, an evening again before a PyCon uh, where I was trying to compile stuff on a slow laptop on like, hotel Wi-Fi to get OpenCV running. Um, it's now got a Pi 3, it's been upgraded and you can now download OpenCV for Python with a bunch of binary packages, so it's way easier to do this now. Um, but it was uh, basically, I had it tracking these these around, you know, various different colored skittles using OpenCV to go and uh, pinpoint them and drive at them. Um, and it was a code that I picked up and took through to learn robotics programming. Uh, it was based on a Fortronics Initio, but I, as in a kind of a robot kit, but I smashed it together uh, with an RC crane. It was kind of a toy hat plus something else mostly because I wanted tracks, because I thought tracks were cool. Uh, it also does have uh, a movable turret, but actually I need another motor controller to wire that into anything. Uh, so it was used actually as a PyWars entry, my first PyWars entry. So PyWars, it's a UK robotics uh, competition for autonomous and manually driven robots. Raspberry Pi at their core, it's really good fun. Um, 
this one had robustness issues. And I mean, you can see parts falling off. The biggest one was the way the batteries were held in, which was just, again, bodged in with some battery uh, six AAs in the back. Uh, it fell off, or oh, batteries fell out of the back when it went up a slope, uh, which was a lot of fun. I'd also just started to play with 3D printing. So although the front bit came out quite well, these side panels, I was, uh, and all need to be replaced. I'd uh, printed where the stress from the screws was in just the place that made them snap off with you know, very little time. Um, as in, it you know, maybe took a few days and they came off. So obviously learn a bit about stress points and where to put stuff. Um, SF, F, the SR, S, SRO4s are on the sides for some kind of maze solving and uh, picking up the sides of things. Um, it has got a custom wire board, uh, just a little thing here where I just kind of fringe it off and wired on it. The only funny thing is I think I designed it uh, component side, then wired it the wrong way up, then took it all the parts, desoldered it and wired it all in the other way. Um, yeah, lots of fun with that. Um, yeah, great for driving manually, but it has no encoders, so accurate turns are kind of an issue. But having gone to piles with it, where robustness is basically your nemesis if you don't get it right, I made a huge list of all the things to fix with it and then promptly built another robot instead. I've got to get them down here. Uh, so then I've got this thing. Um, this thing, I kind of called it big old yellow. Um, I'm not great at naming these things. Um, but it's one of the bigger robots, not quite as big as the arm bot. Um, this aluminium chassis, it was actually a lot bigger, but I made it narrower to fit into the kind of the pie wall spec. Um, the chassis was donated to me from Fortronics, um, and there's also kind of a um, a combo Arduino plus motor controller under there that I'm using kind of as an IO processor. Um, it's got beautiful motors with encoders on board, but I had to kind of ship them in. So as I said, it was a bit too wide. So I bolted these brackets underneath to the main camera further or closer together. Uh, and then I had to rotate the two motors 90 degrees so they weren't fouling each other, which then meant I got into trying to do 3D printed gearboxes which itself was a nightmare, remembering where well, you've got to kind of have places to get your fingers in to get you know things like screws and mount gears into. Um, even now, I'm not entirely happy with it. I think the keyways are not deep enough on the uh, the axles in them. Um, it's only a one-to-one -one 90 degree gearbox. It's no nothing fancy, but it took many, many attempts just to get those to hold together and both mesh, not bind and turn nicely. Um, I like the way this camera turns out, but there's a, a, a mount here for this. Uh, one of the Pi Wars games is Pi Noon, where you stick a, a stick with a pin and a balloon and you try and pop other robots' balloons. Um, that kind of fouls the camera, unfortunately, so I might have to re lower that. Um, there are these lovely spots for big LEDs, and I had the clever idea of putting in RGB strips because although they're, you know, they're lots of fun, um, they're not really bright enough, so I should probably go and put proper LEDs in those. Uh, I also went a bit nuts on the uh, uh, 3D printing with things like motor brackets. This has actually got a oh, sorry, um, power bracket. So it's got a dual battery supply with logic and um, logic and motor battery separate. Um, I started to kind of move away from that, but was, that was where I was at at the time, just because I didn't want to have uh, controller brownouts when there was any stress on the motors. It's got this uh, part that's still here to be fitted, which is a, a line sensor. Um, the main problem I have at the moment is it doesn't like talking to the Raspberry Pi, so I might have to go through the Arduino to get to it. Uh, so just as I was kind of thinking, well, I want to maybe, I don't know, set this up to be uh, better for the next uh, Pi Wars and perhaps not slip so much because these are plastic dreads, uh, I was contacted to start on Learn Robotics Programming, uh, which is the first of my books, where I kind of took the things with the Skittlebot, took some of the lessons from all the other robots and built them into it. Um, it was built for that book. There are no uh, no 3D mounted, uh, 3D printed parts. It's all kit based items. Uh, and there's a bit of uh, breadboarding on the back. Initial version used voltage converters everywhere, um, but the updated one, I kind of avoided them by choosing more uh, three volt based things, although it's three volt HTSRO4s, still tricky to get, and still you get ones that say they are and they're not. 
Um, so you do have to check those. Um, it, there's, there's stuff you can see from some of these robots, like the power system is almost completely lifted from the big yellow robot to the point where I'm using exactly the same spec battery pack from the same, uh, same model and same manufacturer. Um, so I do want to improve on that. Um, this motorboard, I really, I actually really quite like it. It was, a, it's a kind of a no brand. You get them all over Amazon um, and Alibaba and so on. But there's a, again, there's some variations in them. They come very slightly different, but I think they're PCA nine eight six five, so they're ITC based ones. So they only use a couple of ITC pins. You get control, uh, you know, bunch of uh, different, a well, bunch of DC motors, uh, and you can also put a bunch of steppers on them. So the handler can do steppers. Um, so after this one, I started work on lunch, which was a robot for Magpie, which was the Raspberry Pi magazine. Uh, and this was me trying to make something a bit smaller, a bit more compact, and trying a completely different strategy for something, again, someone could reproduce at home. So no 3D printer, no CNC, no fancy machinery. Um, so it's also got low-cost components, like these top things are kind of distance sensors, um, as long as the light therein isn't too bright, and as long as the uh, wall they're looking at is particularly reflective. Um, it's also got no encoders, uh, it has got line, uh, line sensors on it, um, but turns are a bit best effort. It's also got a camera, so it could do some of the open CV things, but it's zero W based, as in Raspberry Pi zero W based, so a bit slow on that. Um, so the thing I probably want to fix most of this is that the wiring is an utter rat's nest, and it could perhaps do with perhaps, I don't know, a strip board version Keeping in play with the, it's something you can go and build yourself and isn't very dependent off some, you know, hard to get PCB as, a, as it were. Um, it's kind of a first of the small robots with one of the bigger changes I made, uh, a power switch. So all the other robots, uh, apart from perhaps the, the big one, all been based on there's a jumper or there's a battery wire you have to put in place to turn them on. This one was where after going to various Pi Wars and then having to run after the robot, pick it up and pull a battery, I went, this one's getting a switch. Um, it also shows one of the uh, big lessons. Don't know if you can see the green spring on the battery power uh, battery box there, which is do not leave your batteries in a robot, especially if you're using alkalines. Uh, they, they tend to leak and then there's a bit of a cleanup. Very frustrating that, done it to a few of them. Uh, so the next one uh, is, and because I did a lunchbox robot, I thought I'd do one for uh, Pi Wars. Uh, this one never saw a Pi Wars because it was a bit of a fateful year and Pi Wars didn't actually end up happening. Uh, this one is a Nerf bot, uh, as in it's got a Nerf launcher on board. Um, kind of particularly pleased with this mechanism. I actually, uh, it wasn't, the mechanism on top isn't my design, but I adapted it for this robot with these uh, Lego mounting plates underneath so a mixture of lunchbox design and a bit of 3d printing uh has lots of fun has some lego wheels um there was a kind of i think a zombie shooting event that was going to be in the uh empire walls that year um there's a rear motor that's off here because i kept finding it was uh i guess it wasn't always going in straight lines and that's because it's not flat bottom on here it's actually kind of Kind of round and slightly warping the the the, uh, the drive, so I was actually looking to looking to put um, either a styrene or three D printed plate to flatten that out. So that's why there's a motor off at the moment. Um, but the bigger problem was is actually I got this up and running, got it moving, uh, got the big Nerf launcher going. The thing about the Nerf launcher is these two motors pulled enough current to basically fry it. So I've got to actually replace power boards and actually uh, it, it killed one of the, the lithium. It's not had to. A lithium ion battery powering it killed that too. Um, so yeah, these uh these pulled an awful lot of power. There isn't much in the way of current sensing on this, which is probably what I need to do to, to fix that up a bit. Uh I am definitely happy with this roof rack though, the uh, the Lego mounting parts. Uh after this one, uh, I think it was about the time that the Raspberry Pico, uh, Raspberry Pi Pico dropped. Uh, so I started experimenting with it uh, and made this little thing here, 
which I think among the smallest robots, it's currently in a state that I'm tearing it apart to replace it. Um, and it's a, a Zumo chassis, and it was going to be Pico Zumo. Uh, I tried mounting things with furniture brackets. I was trying to look at parts that people would just get in their local B and Q or, or just just online from Amazon. Um, they're a little bit large, a little bit rough. They might need some refinement. But again, it was to try and move right away from the three D printing and custom stuff and go, what could anyone try? Um, the electronics didn't quite fit. I had a design for some electronics. Um, and I think actually where I'm going to go with this one, uh, which is kind of way more recent, was the uh, Inventor 2040, which I think would fit beautifully on that robot. Um, I also had to hack the motors. So N20 with encoders type and had to kind of file some extra bits in there, to uh, extra space to make them fit. Um, so I guess this one, it's still a work in progress. And it was dropped because it was around about that time. I was asked to go and write the uh, robotics at home. Um, so it was just about as I was building that, that Pat came to me, asked me if I could do another one. Uh, and it led to building these two, uh, which are the two robotics at home chassis. Um, probably one of the lessons I learned when starting to experiment a lot with these is if you build two, you can experiment, mess with one while the other one's still running. Um, and again, this was all about building with this styrene material, which I kind of experimented with just on the front plate of this Pico Zumo. It's a material everyone can get hold of. It's a material that's really easy to work with. Um, again, stayed well away from any of the th fancy 3D printing and well away from the things that are hard to get hold of. Um, the original uses this blue fruit UART board. Uh, the other one's using a Raspberry Pi Zero just because this UART board is kind of handy. Uh, it's great for a little app, has it's not the fastest throughput perhaps, has no, no real buffering. It's just kind of UART you just set and forget. If you want a data log though, that's when I kind of want to have a, a, a Pi on board. Um, Pico is a great, it's a great controller. I'm having a lot of fun with it, um, but I'd like to do one the Pico W perhaps again. Get uh, try an Inventor 2040 on, on one of these and see how that goes. Uh, and I've got spare parts for most of these things around. Um, I guess the question is what's next? So all of the robots here could all do with tweaking, adjusting. There's always something new can be done to them. Uh, there's always a new robot project. There's always a new challenge, a new place to try and play with a new um, new boards. Um, one of the big ones next I want to play with is uh, this thing here, which is the Make Sense A10. It's a uh, depth of field camera. Um, and actually, the front, front is probably more fun. Uh, this one will send data over serial. Um, so it's like, like a 100 by 100 grid of depth. So then instead of having just a couple of depth sensors, like uh, like the front of one of these, this 100-100 grid can be used to perhaps do more complex routines like SLAM, like uh, something like that, mapping and so on. Um, yet to play with one of these. I've managed to get it on screen, but I'm not connected to a Pi. Uh, similarly is an LD07, which is a, sort of a solid state LiDAR. So LiDAR without the moving parts uses a lot less power. Um, it was why it was interesting when you're talking about I2C things that could turn things on and off because uh, power consumption can be an issue with some of these robots. Um, the moment, probably the thing I'm working on right now is uh, tuning this one. There's, uh, I've been using Monte Carlo localization on a Pico. It needs lots of tuning. It works, but it can be faster. It can have uh, better memory consumption. It could uh, keep its lock when it finds its position more. So I've been tuning that using a Raspberry Pi. The other thing I'd like to try is the um, the, the Seed Shao BLE NRF 52840, which I might try as an alternate uh, Bluetooth chip. So uh, yeah, I mean, I want to also try making some robots with these tiny little steppers that I got from Alibaba. They're Again, N20 size, so they fit in the same brackets, but being steppers, I don't really need to necessarily consider reading the back with encoders. So 
I guess fewer connections, uh, you know, less guessing on how far I've gone. Uh, so I've got plenty of things to try. Um, there's always a matter of time and choosing which to start with and which to carry on with. Right, well, uh, I don't know, I hope that's been uh, interesting and fun, going through the robots and going through some of the problems and some of the issues and some of the uh, some of the ways in which I'm going to, well, improve on them or some of the uh, problems I've hit building them. Um, I'm also going to be doing another talk on Thursday at three, uh, doing a deep dive into uh, this free CAD and styrene cutting process. Um, so a workflow used to make these custom chassis. Uh, it'd be great if uh, people would love to join me for that as well. And uh, I guess we'll go to any questions. I think there are some questions in the chat, um, but I was wondering, I was wondering in the um, so when you start a new robot project, I guess <clears throat> how quickly can you get one up and running? Because you have so much experience now, and you've got sort of a toolkit, if you will, of software and hardware bits. So is it you can I imagine get one started up and running quite quickly within a weekend or something like that? Is that right? So I mean, depending on how complex the chassis is, it's probably twenty or thirty minutes. If you've I mean, if you've got the chassis already made, twenty or thirty minutes. These took a bit longer. Um, because of the cab process and action. Oops. Oh, a bit there. It gets more complicated when you start to add sensors, um, especially when you try out new sensors and they just refuse to talk with a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, I uh, had that. Um, which sensor was it? It might have been what at one point these actually the um, the VL five three LOX and L one X type sensors at one point I think the Raspberry Pi and these refused to talk to each other, um, so I was using HCSR SRO fours for a while. Uh, right, so I guess as you get more experience and the iterations get faster because you sort of got to do chassis up and running and you sort of know what to do, but the first one I guess is is, is probably a lot harder. Yeah, and I'm always trying something new. So I always kind of get that bit done and I always want to push the envelope and try something new. Um, right. Quite guilty of new shiny, um, hence making a great big list, but fi fixing a Pi Wars robot for next year and then just building a new one because I had a shiny tank chassis to play with instead. <laughs> I was also wondering about power consumption with the, respect to the um, you know, DC motors and and you know, pulling a lot of power. Does that mean you're like your, your, your pies end up browning out and stuff like that? Or do you, do you, how do you work around that? Or do you find that actually an issue? It was specifically why this one was built the way it was with a separate uh, logic and motor power was okay. because I had pie browning out issues. Um, the way I've gotten around that with uh, these robots, the, uh, the Pico robots, I mean, Pico uses significantly less power and it's far more tolerant than the Raspberry Pi anyway. Um, but I've also given it the uh, 12 volts here, um, giving it lots of headroom for a UBEC here. So lots of headroom if there is a voltage droop means you're probably not going to be hitting, you know, hitting the point where you're getting any droop out of the UBEC. Right. So uh, I guess one final question for me, so I'm taking all the time, but um, the uh, the Pico, what what are the main advantages of using the Pico over the Pi? Is it just, it just seems like better hardware for, for you know, electronics interfacing where the Pi is, you know, gives you the internet and stuff like that. It's kind of. It's a tricky one. I mean, the Pico, so the Pico W does give you Wi-Fi, um, but the Pico is a different class of device as well. So it's a microcontroller, um, somewhat more advanced than an Arduino, but it's close to that class of thing than the Raspberry Pi. Yeah. So it's using less power. It's perhaps better with real time IO. Um, as in, you know, handling its pins and so on. And the programmable I.O. system on the Pico is frankly amazing. You know, you can actually go and get it to do various kind of uh, serial communications or reading and counting changes on data pins uh, completely autonomously from the main CPU, just feeding back the data when it's got it. Absolutely amazing system. Um, but what it's not going to do for you is it's not going to do the same kind of camera processing at the same speed. You might be able to do something smaller, but you're not going to be able to handle resolution uh, that you would on a Pi. You don't have the memory throughput. So, and, and you certainly aren't going to be able to do a very big fancy GUI. So 
they're kind of different where one's a computer, the other one's a microcontroller. Um, yeah. I could well see a project using a complementary pair of them with the Pico as kind of an IO processor, um, much in the way, uh, where is it? One of these robots. Um, oh, this one, yeah, the, the big yellow one has that Arduino as a kind of an IO coprocessor. Yeah. Um, and you could, I could see a Pico doing it. I mean, maybe using a, a Pico plus motors board with the Pi playing a kind of a rider on top. Yeah, it does seem like a really good combination. The, the Pico, not even a Pico dev, but just the Pico itself with, with the Pi would be a really good, nice combination, yeah. Having Sorry, a look just... at the, uh, was it the chat we've got? Uh, so Brian talking about splitting the brain, few Picos or an RP plus Pico. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the RP plus Pico I've been experimenting with over here. Um, and actually, I had a look at trying to do SPI. Now, I've been doing stuff with CircuitPython. CircuitPython does not like being uh, an SPI device. It wants to be the bus master. So does the Raspberry Pi. In fact, I think the Broadcom uh, firmware on it won't let it be an SPI device. So I had to go right off the SPI uh, setup. Had a look at maybe making an I2C setup, and I think that could still work. Because um, this one, I wanted to be able to actually access uh, send code and access the... Um, the, the Python REPL and uh, file system on the Pico, I found that USB is the easiest way. That fancy looking cable there is just a USB cable with uh, custom headers on the end, just to kind of make it fit in smaller spaces. Um, but yeah, also a couple of Picos in tandem where you might have, say, some Picos dealing with specific fancier hardware and fancier algorithms, talking to others, which would be significantly cheaper than a Pico plus a Pi at the moment. Um, the splitting power for brain and locomotion, it kind of works. It just takes up a lot of space and weight, um, but it does save that browning out head room issue completely. Have I tried the beagle bone? Not yet. It is in my list of things actually you get hold of, I think is it the beagle bone black um, and also getting some of the um, connectors so I can crimp some connectors on. Um, crimping, definitely a skill worth learning if you're doing the robotics. Um, the Neato BotVac chassis. You all haven't come across that one. Um, I might make a note of that for later. That's kind of cool. Uh, so haven't tried that, haven't seen that yet, but that's a cool idea. Um, Ross being heavyweight. I've So I've played with Ross a little bit. I've not based many of my robots on it, and that's partially because I keep coming back to just trying to build things, either using various libraries or from kind of, base things in Python. Um, I do like the fact that there's a messaging queue in Ross. Uh, and I think, you know, for a more complicated robot where you perhaps want some layers to be more robust, other layers to be kind of more experimental, it might make sense to do a couple that, that way. I'm still not 100% convinced that the whole of Ross is what I want for it, but pilfering some of the algorithms from it, I'm, I'm, I'm not beyond that. I think you know, open source is all good. Um, what else have we got? Uh, yes, you can run Ross on Raspberry Pi. It, it does, but it kind of wants to be, uh, I think it's a specific distribution of Ubuntu. I think you can kind of adapt it to Raspberry BIOS, but it, uh, there's some complication around there. An LED matrix on the front, that is what I've done with this thing. So those two top bits are LED matrices. Um, some of the others I've just gone with RGB LED strips which give me sensor and power lights and things like that. Uh, just trying to get have a look at all of these questions. Um, like a clown car of robots. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, uh, and so I, mean, I think I think you're talking about the one with the bits that have all keep falling off with the uh, 3D printed bits. Um, it, it really did. Uh, there was, a, I think, a ras uh, was it the high walls. There was a event, I think, a golf a golf event. We had to push up a ball up the slope, and bits just started falling off when it was trying to go up the slope. Um, cool. So, have we got any? Oh, Darwin collection, Raspberry Pi evolution, awesome. Has anyone got? Um, any other questions? I see one about programming languages. Um, 
mostly Python with some C. I sometimes like to, so certainly the Arduino ones were C-based. Um, sometimes I'll do a C-based thing uh, so I can wrap it up in Python. Um, I tend to like to glue it up, glue it together with Python as much as I can. Uh, making tracks or making tank tracks. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid, actually, I don't have recommendations because these are toy hacks, so they came with tracks, uh, as did that uh, that great big yellow chassis. The one thing I will say is that the the rubberized tracks work a lot better, uh, whereas the uh, the plastic tank chassis ones, they kind of slid down a, a, a slope which wasn't particularly grippy, so they had some traction issues. The opposite issue comes with the rubberized ones, where sometimes if you've got a surface a lot of friction, like a carpet, then they'll have trouble turning on them. Uh, what kind of educational background? Um, I don't think you need to have a particularly strong educational background, but I think you've got to be willing to kind of, uh, I guess, dive in. You know, when you get the basics, you can throw together and get a robot moving without a lot. Um, but when you start getting into things like how you do specific turns, how you kind of do location, some of the more complex sensor algorithms, it would help them to go and get a bit of a crash course in maths. Um, I came at some of these realizing that I thought I knew probability and I knew nothing about probability. Um, so probability distribution functions was not a term I'd have been able to talk, to, talk about three years ago um so even if you kind of fell asleep during you know gcse statistics it won't be an issue you know and it's a, a lot of it is very much a learning by doing or project based um i think like uh i think emmanuel was saying about you get into a project you go right i gotta learn some stuff for this project i get into there and it's a lot about that and then sometimes you've got to dive in theory sometimes the theory will type you up for a couple of months but you've already built the platform so you can experiment with the theory and it certainly holds together much better when you can actually throw it at something and you know see things drive into a wall or something um i try not to do that with the robots because otherwise they're going to clown car mode um 3d printing tracks i've seen it done um so if is it, i think um i think dr footleg on twitter has done uh 3d printed tracks um you probably have to come back and rubberize them as if you've got tpu for the same traction issues. So uh, there's even things about printing place. So if you can do multi-material with TPU, that might work. Yeah, if you've got a robot kit, go and, go and, go and build it and hack at it. Um, I'm all about the things you can build and hack at. I think uh, uh, if I've got a robot that is, you know, the nice molded kind, I'd be taking the top off of that to see what's inside it pretty quickly. Um, I'm not known for leaving things alone like that for too long. Breakout PCB for Connect, it makes it much smaller work on five volts. Oh, oh, that'd be quite interesting to play with. That's, um, and again, it's kind of another um, depth grid sensing, isn't it, you get with the Connect? Yeah, we have that video available on uh, on YouTube if you want to take a look at it. So next, um, next presentation, it's because maybe four or five months ago, maybe a bit longer. Mm. So he's making a big a big robot, wasn't it, Nick? It's sort of like using um, scooter motors, if I'm, or sorry, um, hoverboard motors. Is that right? It's pretty cool. I, I was wondering, Dan, if, if you've done any sort of drones or um, um, sort of water-based ones. I, I guess I didn't see any. I was just wondering if you're interested in that sort of thing. I, I saw um, one on a submarine, and it was quite fascinating for me. I've not done any drones. I have definitely, I'm interested at some point in doing a submarine robot. In fact, I think the idea that fascinates me would be to try and do um, kind of an amphibious robot, the kind that would be able to roll up to one of those lovely lakes in uh, Richmond Park and um, try not to horrify the ducks too much as it drives on into the lake bottom and surveys it. Um, I think from what I've seen, you probably need to tether them because um, I think RF pretty much goes out the window as soon as you get any depth in. Um, and none of these robots right now are robust enough that I'd let them get anywhere near water. <laughs> uh, but it is certainly I'm interested. In. I think there's that uh, the the video with the uh, 
uh, was it the, the guy who does the Lego encased in a tube thing? Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Pretty awesome. That is pretty awesome. Make the submarine look like the Nautilus. Oh, yes. Very nice. Yeah. Mm. So Lee, has, Lee has a question there. I don't know if Lee, um, four or five from the bottom. Building a sentry robot. I don't know, Lee, if you want to elaborate. Oh, if you question. go to the to build a room map and navigate. I mean, I guess this is, yes. Um, one of the areas I want to get into investigating is stuff with SLAM. Um, much like I've done with Monte Carlo, it's kind of one of those I'd like to kind of get into part by part building up the algorithm. Um, uh, it's what I've bought these things, these, uh, you know, these uh, depth of field cameras and the solid state LIDAR, LIDAR for us to exactly play with uh, mapping and SLAM algorithms, um, building a room map. That, that's exactly the idea. Um, so yes, it, it is something I'm interested in. And again, I probably will be looking with some depth at some of the algorithms in, in ROS2 um, to see, you know, to see how, I guess, how they tackled some of the same problems. Cool. Any, any other any questions? Else? Or is there any any robots you want to have a look more at the detail at if I really want to get get them under the camera? I did have a question about um, the ultrasonic sensor versus LIDAR. I just wonder which we you choose when, or you know, a lot of ultrasonics. I know you have you know, one or two time of flight things. Just wondering which one you'd use or which one you prefer. Um, so the ultrasonic sen sensors are cheaper. Uh, they're also simpler if you want to connect a bunch of them up, um, partially because actually the the, the I guess you've got these time of flight optical sensors. They all choose the same ITC address. So you've got to do a little dance or use multiple buses. Um, so yeah, these tend to be kind of cheap and easy to throw at things. Um, and they have a certain aesthetic. And I think uh, the other week when uh, um, Kevin was doing a presentation, uh, similarly, I think he was using uh, HCSRO4s because they also have a particular aesthetic they give to robots. They're cute, right? Exactly. You know, I mean, they're, they're, and, and actually, uh, maybe I didn't get into it, was with this hexapod, without putting that HCSR04 on it, it was mostly, the original point is it wasn't even wired in, it was just so I knew which way the front was, because without it, you can't tell front or back on, on it, you know, it's just, the, the, there's too much going on to know which part's the front. So just, just using it just to say, that's the front of the robot, which again, you know, this one, uh, not so much. Um, the so I've not actually again played with the, the bigger lidar systems. Um, so this thing I'm expecting actually, you know, it, it's a camera. It's I think uh, what 100 by 100 pixels. Um, it's going to be a far more complex thing to interface with and to handle the data from than HDS04. So I think if you're just trying to do wall avoiding, then you know what these are fine. If you want more precision mapping, they're not going to get you that. Um, the other issue is, I think they've gotten much better, but certainly the earlier time of flight light-based optical ones, they would end up being messed with just by having uh, LED light sources or fluorescent light sources or a particularly bright sunny day. Uh, and you, you would see people at pie walls struggling on particular you know, uh, events because they were too close to the window and it was really sunny. Um, but I think it's gotten a lot better, but it used to be an issue. Let's be careful by the one salon and knippen by the other. Precies. Maar thuis doe je eigenlijk hetzelfde met je energie, internet en sim only. Combineer alles gewoon bij één. Sorry, sec. Hopefully, the mic was interesting. Oh, it's all about people in month. Crazy. Hmm. Yeah, so. I guess uh, it depends on the situation. I'd still say the SRO4s are the cheapest route and they're the easiest thing to get hold of. Just beware of the three volt, five volt thing because some of them are marked three volt and are still the five volt ones and don't work with a pie without a level shifter, which is really frustrating. So I've had some, some supply issues with getting the three volt version. Hmm. Well, there's no other 
questions. Well, thank you very much, Diana. That's really, uh, really good. Can you, can you just remind us the, the names of your books? You have, do you have the books there? Could yeah, uh, cool. Yes. Yeah. So the most yes. recent one, it's uh, Robotics at Home with Raspberry Pi Pico. Uh, and that's all about building these robots here, um, including building a custom chassis design. Uh, for Raspberry Pi stuff, as in not Pico, oh, it's just over here, uh, there's Learn Robotics Programming. Um, so they, they kind of have a slightly different take, I guess. So that one is more the custom chassis, but also talks about Monte Carlo localization mm -hmm. on a Pico using Circuit Python, which perhaps is a bit brave, but made that work. Um, this one gets into using OpenCV. Both talk about using PID algorithms. Uh, this one also does some things with speech control. So there is a companion device to this robot, which is uh, was running Mycroft, although I think yeah, Mycroft is kind of dead or dying. Um, so I'll be looking to a version based on one of the more local speech agents, but you can use a speech agent to interact with it um, and running a kind of a web service so you can control that from the phone via Wi-Fi and these from a phone via uh, Bluetooth and BA. Uh, so yes, there's... Two books. The uh, at the moment with the uh, the Raspberry Pi supply issues, the Raspberry Pi Pico is definitely the way to go. But I do see that uh, I think uh, Raspberry Pi are getting a handle on that at the moment. Their supply issues, and as someone said, it might also be time to give the uh, the Beagle Bone a, a try and see how that goes as well. Cool. Yeah, I didn't realize how uh, how weighty those books were. They're quite thick. <laughs> Must take a long lot of effort to write them. Well done. See the so very well rated and uh, well very well rated and uh, on Amazon I see. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah, quite pleased with how that's going. Someone's also asked for a link for the fabrication session. I've just posted that um, the uh, CAD to cutting a chassis journey. Um, so free CAD, basically, you know, picking up free CAD, doing kind of the simplest possible thing that will work in free CAD. To get a custom chassis, but again, the idea being the simple, simplest possible thing gives you the confidence to do slightly more complex things, slightly more complex things, and the next thing you know, yeah, you know, you're designing things like that. Uh, and, and that has been a lot of my process. Start with the simplest thing, and then iterate, and it gets more and more complex. Because if I start complex, and I've done that before, I end up with clan cars. Yeah. <laughs> Well done. Thanks very much for that. It's very, uh, very, very interesting. Cool. Cool. Yep. Thank you.